we're back. We're live. This is Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. So the nine o'clock block on a given Wednesday, and we have Chris Kubeka. Uh, she's a good hacker. Good hacker smile. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> she joins us, and she's she's been writing books about this and and hiring on in various places around the world to help people with hacking. Uh, Chris, say hi and hold up your book, your latest book. Hello, everyone. Um, this is my latest book, Hack the World with Open Source Intelligence Gathering. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So we start with the Colonial Pipeline. You know, what happened? Well, Colonial Pipeline, unfortunately, did not have the greatest cybersecurity. And there currently aren't strict regulations that critical infrastructure companies like Colonial Pipeline have to. Um, there's also the sticky problem of the fact that they had had outstanding um, job posts for a security manager for two and a half months. And it doesn't look like they were focusing that much on the risks of technology security, but more the business risks. And technology risks, they uh, affect business risks. We got a problem here. And I was telling you before the show how impressed I was with um, uh, this book that just came out about the Secret Service, you know, uh, indicating that the Secret Service, who, who we all respect and admire, actually is uh, not all that effective. It hasn't been all that effective, and it isn't all that effective. It's been compromised in so many ways. And uh, the public is wrong to believe that, uh, you know, the president and his, and his people are uh, protected. And so the same here. I mean, I, we have that we carry around this notion that the government will protect. I'm from the government. I'm here to protect you, right? Uh, <laughs> It isn't really true. Well, can you can give me a, just a, a pretty see handle on whether the government is competent to do this, how well it does in protecting us from big hacking jobs, hacking of government agencies, hacking of the you know, industrial military complex, um, hacking of the infrastructure? How, how well protected are we? Well, I'll give you a good example. When I was 10 years old, I was busted by the Department of Justice for breaking into the FBI. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> things have changed. However, they have not changed enough. And one of the things that I run into is various government agencies, typically their focus is not cybersecurity. They might dabble a bit or have certain functions like the FBI has a cyber crime team, but that is not their main focus. Even though we're seeing more and more that the majority of uh, costs of crime are now shifting from the physical world to the digital world, and yet there still isn't a really strong focus where it needs to be. Um, the government could uh, become more competent. Um, however, they're also constrained by the fact that it currently can take up to a year and a half to get a uh, security clearance to work in those types of jobs. So how do you dynamically hire a bunch of good people when they can't actually sit at a computer and do their job? Um, so that's a, kind of an impossible situation. And uh, another thing to understand about the government, and this affects most governments around the world, is they might have this uh, team called a computer emergency response team. And that's when everything hits the fan. Um, think of them as the fire department. Your house is already on fire. It's probably going to be lost, but they are trying to stop the blaze so it doesn't affect other houses around you. But there's only a couple of countries in the world that actually have what I call a SEPT, a computer emergency prevention team to actually and actively uh, look at critical infrastructure and go, hey, Colonial Pipeline, we found all these problems. Uh, let us help you fix these because somebody could, you know, cause gas shortages along the East Coast of the United States. So this is, this is a, a great concern because it is infrastructure. It affected millions and millions of people. It disrupted, um, you know, the supply of um, of so many things, including gas products, and and it um, and and there was nothing we could seem to do about it, and it was ransomware. That was that was really interesting to me because at first the news plainly to see the news was no, we didn't pay, we don't pay ransomware, and one of my buddies said no, they do pay ransomware, <laughs> otherwise it wouldn't have gotten they wouldn't have gotten it up again. And sure enough, a few days later, well, it, it, it came out. They did pay ransomware, $5 million. I, uh, I, I wonder if, the, if the, um, the hackers could have gotten more than that, actually, because the stakes were so high. 
but you know you you, you really have to think twice um, about how well protected we are and and who is attacking us. Can you give us a, a handle on who might have been responsible for colonial pipeline? So it's been traced back to a particular uh, cyber gang out of Russia. And what's interesting about that is Russia does not allow the extradition of their citizens, no matter how blatant or open it is. Uh, one of these gang members actually has an Instagram account where he posts his supercars uh, purchased with the illicit gains of ransomware. And uh, what makes it even worse is uh, for those who want to do these types of attacks to make a, a quick buck, um, they also were reselling what's called ransomware as a service. So just like many of us use Office 365 as a software of a service, um, you get ransomware as a service. So it's um, more complicated than it needs to be, but easy to do these types of attacks. And one other thing to add is the ransomware gangs have been watching very closely what uh, cyber insurance pays out, and they try to stay below those minimums so that they can actually get paid. So um, they're really looking at the economics and how much money they can get without it causing too much problems. Uh, well, this is a bit of a digression, but I just read that uh, two major Bitcoin <clears throat> uh, Bitcoin companies have, have crashed this morning, and not a big surprise. Uh, like they lost half their value, and you know, and collectively in, a ter in terms of billions. And I recall that the ransomware off often asks you to pay off in in Bitcoin. Um, so query whether you know, you know, the what do you want to call it, the, the decline of the value of Bitcoin has an effect on ransomware. Absolutely, we've actually seen increases in ransomware type of attacks when cryptocurrency was higher and then less attacks when it's lower, because it's just not as advantageous to do that. Mm, interesting. So if, uh, oh, by the way, uh, so we, we're pretty sure the Russians do it. It's consistent with their whole attitude about things. But query, yes. what about the Chinese? Are they, are they also uh, doing this to us? Well, not so much ransomware attacks, uh, because they generally don't need the money. Um, however, there are other countries that do do this who are sanctioned countries like North Korea and Iran, uh, where they do desperately need the money. And North Korea is probably one of the bigger offenders in this area. Hmm. Um, gee, I have so many questions for you, but let me let me ask you the one the one that really appeals to me. So suppose I'm 10 years old, just picking that number. <laughs> and, and I decide, you know, that I want to do something like this. I mean, high, high profile, tell all my friends in school what I did, what not. How would I start? And how, and how um, so, you know, ransomware or hacking as a service, as the case may be, how available is it for me? Uh, you know, can I buy it or subscribe to it for a dollar half and learn how to do this? And will it work? Well, uh, there are some uh, packages that you can purchase or rent uh, where uh, if you purchase the software, it'll cost you probably about 2500 uh, all the way up to 15000 But of course, you could do other types of attacks uh, to come up with that money first, or you can rent the service, software as a service, and they will take uh, part of the take of uh, what you hit and what you generally do is and remember i am a good hacker um, is you perform something called uh systems-based open source intelligence gathering or uh, what some of the intelligence community calls reconnaissance and you will find um your target and some of their easy vulnerabilities because ransomware is a more simplistic attack it is something that attaches to things that um, nearly anybody could find. If you can recognize, oh, I found this hole, ransomware can now go into it, uh, then you've got gold. Um, and then once you start doing that, uh, you start making money. And then when you want to move your money out of uh, cryptocurrency, there are uh, services, uh, which it's uh, the digital version of money laundering called uh, the laundromats. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they will clean up your cryptocurrency so that you actually have uh, cash currency in hand. Mm. Okay, <clears throat> so the, the question that follows is exactly uh, how does this work? How does this work to the ransomware user? 
um, how does this work? Um, you know, in in the computer, uh, and and it's okay. You can you don't have to hold back. Tell us what it's like to be a hacker. Um, what <laughs> what steps do you take? Um, what what is the expertise involved, and how do you implement the plan? Well, um, so you you pick what you want to do, and there are so many different ways to make money off of cybercrime. We've all seen uh, spam attacks. Um, and spam attacks also, by the way, do not affect just computers. They also affect Internet of Things. Um, I was once involved in a spam attack that involved uh, Internet uh, capable refrigerators. So it uh, wasn't just keeping the milk cold. And once you figure out your, the type of attack you want to do, which is available to the target and also the type of, uh, say, software that you'll need to buy, uh, the criminal software, you go ahead and link those two things together. Try to hide yourself. That's a big difference between a bad hacker and a nice hacker. Um, is try to hopefully cover your tracks and avoid uh, law enforcement knocking at your door. And once you do that, uh, you also will set up some sort of uh, encrypted communications, usually uh, conversations private, and also check out the financials of your target. Uh, if they are willing to pay and capable of paying X amount and you don't want to be too pushy because you want your money quick, then you're going to only uh, charge that amount uh, quick in, quick out. Okay. How, how does it work, actually? I mean, what, what, kind, of, um, what kind of software um, process is involved? I, I know I've got to find a portal, but this software to find the portal. Now I've found the portal, um, and I guess, I guess, is it fair to say you can always find a portal somehow? Always thank you, find thank a portal, you. yes. Yeah. So now um, I found a portal, what do I do with my portal? Well, as long as your ransomware uh, software package is capable of uh, getting both into the portal uh, and also uh, once you find either the operating system like Windows or Linux or whatever it might be, or an application within it, it can then take advantage of a system in a couple of different ways. One is what we would call bricking it, making it unusable unless uh, you provide some sort of uh, code or way or method to bring it back. Another way is through the use of encryption. Many of us encrypt our stuff every day more and more. and. Uh, the difference is they're the ones encrypting, they hold the keys, and they will only give you the keys if you pay up. But on a side note, um, even if you pay up and they say they're giving you your encryption keys, some of the ransomware software actually cannot decrypt. So you've lost your money and your stuff. Oh, how nice. Now, I don't, I don't have to code in order to achieve that, right? Nope. I can use uh, these software products I can get off the, off the, uh, the net. Um, I can just uh, drag and drop and push buttons and, and, and create this monster that will go out there through the portal and do these things and encrypt and maybe, maybe or maybe not decrypt. Um, so it's not like I have to write assembly code to do this, right? Correct. And it's becoming easier and easier uh, every day. Uh, they make software packages available for those who know how to use a mouse and can click. Oh, wow. um, so point and click, boom, you're in. Mm. Well, that's, that's troublesome. Uh, you mentioned before that Russia had, uh, you know, closed down any extradition of uh, its hackers. And, uh, you know, it's a good strategy if you have the Internet Research Agency and other organizations in Moscow doing that on a regular basis, which I think they do. Um, so the question is, um, how, how do we stop this? How do we nab the bad guys? How do we find them, individual people, and uh, arrest and prosecute and convict and imprison them? How do we do that? Well, um, I don't think we're going to change uh, Mr. Putin's mind anytime soon about the extradition of Russian citizens. Uh, we do have sanctions, which sometimes work, but they also cost money, time, and effort to actually enforce. And many times they're just on paper because they can't actually enforce them. Um, there are several ways, for instance, uh, the FBI has been able to uh, nab individuals when they go on vacation uh, to some exotic place and they speak to the local government and say, listen, we want to you know, take this person back. 
Um, that sometimes works. But another way that works, and this is something that the Dutch have been doing for a while, because they're a bit unique. Uh, they actually have in place in law where as long as a prosecutor signs off on it, they can hack back. And this was part of what was done in this particular case where they went after the wallet of some of these uh, individuals of the gang. And they made it uh, economically uh, much more difficult for them to get away with this by taking some of their cryptocurrency. Uh, they can also hack into uh, their systems, uh, get to their contacts, and generally make life difficult for them. Yeah, I, I just um, <clears throat> I wonder um, in, in, in identifying a, a potential hack, um, are there are there, do, are there signals that I should be looking for? Uh, or does this happen like all of a sudden? Is, is it a ramp up? Is it, is, are there some telltale signs, canary in the coal mine, coal mine sort of thing? Or is it bang? Well, yes, there actually is. Uh, there are ways that you can see that people are probing your systems and you can set up alerts for that. There's also a system called canary tokens uh, where you can actually set up little canaries in the coal mine. And if any of the juicy bits or areas are accessed, it alerts you. Of, what it does is say, there is no legitimate purpose for someone snooping around or going in this way or that way. So now you know you definitely have a problem because the canary has died. You know, I've, I've often thought, maybe this is a naive tale, but I've often thought that if you could reorganize the internet, if you could, make everybody stand up and identify himself or herself before they had access to bloody anything, then you can stop this. But how likely is it that the internet can ever be reformed that way? I think it's pretty unlikely for a couple of different reasons. Um, when the internet was set up, uh, they had no security in mind. They did not think that it would be the way it is right now. So anytime you have to bolt on things, uh, it's going to be much more difficult clunky and uh, not going to work the way that you intended. Uh, so I think we have to look at um, an alternate type of internet that is actually set up more for security. And for the identification portion, um, not everyone is either going to be able to produce a valid ID or uh, you can quite easily fake these things. Uh, several years ago, uh, me and a journalist from the Netherlands, we got um, in IDs that look very much like German identification cards at a conference. And he used his to get into uh, about 30 different uh, government buildings because they didn't actually look all that closely. And he did a news story on it. And you can easily fake these things. Uh, and then you know, if, if someone wants your ID, like Instagram or something like that, they just ask you to take a picture with your face in it and your ID, but they don't actually check to see if you know, the ID is valid. So uh, it's not a very easy thing. There's always a little social and social engineering involved. Absolutely. And social engineering gives you, you know, some tremendous leverage. Suppose I am the IT manager of a very large utility company in the United States. And this uh, utility company is, um, you know, connected by, you know, the electric grid to a large geo geographical area in the United States. Um, and the, the damage that would, would be done would be if, if somebody hacked this, uh, it did ransomware or just brought it down as a geopolitical decision, brought it down, uh, call it war, if you like. Um, and, and I am responsible for um, stopping this and defending against it and protecting. Um, what, what do I do? Do I do I uh, did I do I call you up, Chris? What do I do? You can call me up. You can also contact your local computer emergency response team, who should be able to get involved and help you with your contacts of who uh, you call next. And there's even some talk of, in certain circumstances, if your national guard is capable of assisting. However, um, since most National Guard are not cyber warriors, um, that uh, still would have to be matured and thought out very, very carefully. Mm. You know, I, you know one, one thing that has struck me over the years when you read these stories about, um, you know, hacking and cyber attacks 
is that they, they seem to happen at random, but never never in close proximity to each other. In other words, you wouldn't, you wouldn't find one one week and one the next week. No, 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 the, they're spread out and they happen only after, it seems like, only after you've gotten complacent again, only after you've come to the conclusion, hey, this doesn't really affect me, I don't have to worry so much. And then bang, another one. Um, so is, is that the way this is done? And if that's the way it's done, um, then the people who do it, especially if they're coordinated through, for example, the, Ru the Russian government, um, they could do it in quick time too. Uh, they could bring the grid down the Northeast and the Southeast and the West and so forth uh, in quick time. Is there anything preventing that? Or is that something in the future? Well, it's difficult to prevent if uh, you, uh, the organization is not actively looking for ways uh, to get in. And I'm glad you, you mentioned uh, the, the Russia example, because there's a reason why I put uh, a picture of Putin on the back of my latest book. Can you show us the picture? I want to see the picture. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> candor. <laughs> the power of candor. <laughs> right. I'm probably not allowed in Russia now. Um, and also, when they uh, hit organizations, they try to divert resources. They're going to pick not Monday morning at 9 a.m. They're going to pick a holiday period of uh, low staffing uh, times. They're also going to say, hey, if I get, say, the FBI uh, cyber team out to the Northeast, I'm also going to hit the Southeast. Then I'm going to hit, you know, this other area and this other area so that they're so spread thin um, that they're not as effective as they should be or could be. Uh, so there are, are ways to this. And if they're not as effective and there are multiple things getting hit, that means that it'll be also more likely for you to pay the ransom. Yeah, and it seems to be. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm not suggesting that that uh, the individual is off the hook here. You know, me me running my uh, my computer at home or my laptop, so forth. Um, but it's more likely, is it not? Um, especially with uh, sophisticated uh, attacks, that'll be a big company. And it seems to me also that 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 it's getting bigger and bigger. Um, not only because of the ego trip involved, but because because we can. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, imagine this. Nowadays, uh, warfare causing a crisis used to involve uh, people on the ground, sabotage teams, tanks, some planes, some boats. But you can now do that all just at a click of a button over the Internet from anywhere in the world. So the amount of effort that it used to take moving people in the logistics now is just in the digital form and can be done lickety split very, very quickly once you find a hole. Uh, so it's moving more and more towards that. And even uh, crime in general is moving more towards the digital world. I mean, we've seen uh, with the pandemic, there's been some crimes that have been cut down, but at the same time, cybercrime has gone up because we couldn't see each other. And we're also seeing uh, traditional uh, criminal gangs uh, move into cyber because it's a higher profit margin. They don't have to worry about the logistics of smuggling this arms or uh, these particular drugs. They can make the same amount of money or more from anywhere in the world in a location where they can't be extradited from. You know, it seems that ransomware is a pretty good business model because you can be, you know, you can be a, a ninja. You, you, you know, you can you can operate with a small cell of people in Albania and no and nobody will know you. And you, you're not re working for anyone else, particularly you're just working for your own um, profit, profit margin on, on the, um, the cost of doing it versus the uh, benefit of, uh, of having a ransomware. But I'm wondering also if there are other business models out there. For example, somebody comes to me. This is a horrible example. Somebody comes to me and say, you know, I, I have, I am, I'm a big company. I have a competitor. I want to bring that competitor down. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm and it's the same guy in Albania, right? Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to pay you a million dollars to bring him down for a few hours on a given Thursday. Um, can you do that? Yes, I can do that. Okay, go do it, and I will pay you in Bitcoin. It'll be our little deal together. Is that another business model that, that, that you find in this area? Yes, there is, uh, especially amongst competitors, we've seen um, 
in Texas, there was a case of a hacker that was hired by one oil company to attack another oil company. And uh, when it comes to critical infrastructure, uh, it can go all the way up to the point where, for example, over two and a half year period, the Iranian government approached me personally and offered me 120,000 um, a month to uh, teach them how to hack into critical infrastructure with a focus on nuclear facilities. Well, a lot of these state actors are just as irresponsible as the guys in Albania, I have to say. And it, it seems to me that where we're going with this, Chris, is we're going to have more hackers um, and the defensive mechanisms are not going to keep up with the, you know, uh, the hacking mechanisms. Um, and we're going to have more random uh, infrastructure attacks, r random institutional attacks, random attacks on government. But we also have the risk of having, uh, you alluded to it, a war where you, you try to take another country or a group of countries and just undermine everything there. And no, not a shot is fired. Nobody's hurt. There's even, there isn't even a physical, a physical expression of the war. It's just that all your infrastructure came down and all your institutions are inoperative. I mean, is that where we're going on this? I believe so. Uh, certainly cybercrime is a growth industry, uh, but so are digital arms, which are sold around the world. And uh, they've got different purposes, you know, either for criminality or for other governments to attack other governments or surveil them. And there are some countries that uh, part of their uh, GDP is driven on uh, some of these digital tools, which can also unfortunately be used as weapons to do this. So uh, it's going to uh, keep getting worse because it's kind of easy to do. Um, you know, it's, it's easy enough for a 10 year old. Uh, it's easy enough uh, looking at a few videos and taking about half a day to watch these videos on uh, various places similar to YouTube and then making a few grand that day your first go out. Not bad. That'll buy you a lot of sugar candy if you like. Um, so <laughs> so what about the, the Rip Van Winkle sleeper thing? You know, where, I mean, for example, it, it occurs to me that in the case of Colonial Pipeline, um, they said, um, government said, I guess, or the oil industry said, uh, we had to take a few days and look at it and make sure that it was clean. Really? Um, actually, they had to take a few days and pay off the ransom is more like what happened. Um, but, but is it possible, is it happening that the cyber attacker is leaving little, little crumbs behind? They're very hard to find these crumbs, but they can be activated at a point in time later. Um, is this the kind of thing that happens, uh, for example, if I buy software that comes from a Russian company and there are some doing, you know, grand business in the United States, they're very good, very good software. But um, could it be that they are leaving little crumbs and one day they can activate, you know, 20 million computers to do something as their agents in a kind of mesh network attack? Is this possible with the crumbs? Uh, yes, it can be possible. We actually call it a logic bomb for a reason. And I'll give you a good example. In 2012, uh, Saudi Aramco, big energy company, was hit with one of these, a logic bomb, which sat in their systems for months. And only at a certain time, at 11.08 a.m. on August 13th, 2012, uh, did they activate that. And then it destroyed uh, over 80 percent of their computer systems inside Saudi Arabia and caused something similar to the Colonial Pipeline where there were gas shortages because their systems not actually load gasoline onto those tanker trucks. And it affected uh, country of Saudi Arabia and Bahrain, and eventually Qatar. And so we were looking at if they did not restore their systems in a timely manner, 39% uh, of the world's energy was affected and a barrel of oil could have gone up to $450 a barrel. Hmm. Looking forward to better times. So what last question, Chris, <laughs> tell me how I should think about this. Tell me how I should think about this as a, an IT manager for a company or a government agency uh, that, that is a potential victim. Tell me how I should think about this as a member of the public concerned that my, 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 my society is protected. How should I think about this? 
Well, as an IT manager, uh, there are many low cost, no cost tools out there that you can actually set alerts and look proactively at your infrastructure. Because even if your team isn't doing all of the management, your third party might, and all they have to do is make one mistake and you've got a big hole. So uh, if you do not have a great budget for security, there are ways that you can actually address it. Um, for governments, they need to look at proactive security. We need smoke alarms before there is a four alarm fire and a way that the public trusts us enough to speak with the government and go, yeah, here's some data. We, you know, we weren't sure before, but we think so. Uh, and they're not afraid of getting hit with a big stick for reporting what might be a crime or is a crime. And for members of the public, if you get hit uh, with any sort of ransomware or spam attacks or things like that, although not all police departments will be receptive, uh, there's some that are. And you can also uh, contact the uh, U.S. government's national uh, CERT and report what had happened. And they add that to a database to try to figure out how to stop it. And they've got various alerts and things on how to keep you safe. They even have a database of some of the encryption keys for ransomware that hit consumers for you to unlock your data. Ah, well, we live in strange times, getting stranger. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, this is this I think is more and more this is going to dominate our society. And all I can say for myself is that I'm concerned and that if they catch anybody um, who is charged um, with um, hacking and um, ransomware and the like, call me because I want to volunteer for the jury. I want to be. <laughs> I have a few things I want to say to the other members of the jury. <laughs> well, thank you, Chris. Uh, we have, oh, we have a question from a viewer. How effective are uh, antivirus solutions at detecting ransomware encryption in progress and halting files from being uh, encrypted en masse? And let me add another one uh, along the same lines. Are encryption keys typically discovered and released after a period of time after the malware has been analyzed? Or is it wishful thinking to hope for decryption keys to be released? Can you get around that one? Yep. So on the antivirus, some antivirus is better than others. Um, so you have to be very aware of that, uh, even though your role might not be in security. Um, so. Uh, the antivirus, sometimes it can, but very much like with COVID, uh, it needs to know what the illness is before it can uh, actually build a vaccine to address it. So if you're one of the first, you're kind of out of luck. Um, on the uh, encryption key side, uh, sometimes when they can actually analyze the malware and find a way in, because sometimes malware has its own exploits that a government agency or an organization can actually exploit. And once they find those keys, uh, there are uh, two places you can find them. One is uh, via US CERT, and another is uh, EU CERT, which publish those keys as soon as they're found, and you can then use it to decrypt. Chris Kubeka, can you give us your, uh, your, um, your website so we can take a look at this? Uh, yes, it is mei.edu, which stands for the Middle East Institute. And uh, my area is the cyber area, where we write about and also write policy on uh, these particular topics and how they affect us. It's been great to talk to you. I, I have a feeling that I would like to call you again uh, for the next major attack so we can share notes on that one, too. Thank you, Chris. Chris Kubeka, I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jay. Aloha.